optimizing the rendering tool chain. I'm Paul Norman. I'm an OpenStreetMap developer. I work with, among things, rendering, obviously. And uh, for some past work, uh, Frederick Ram has done a couple of presentations that one of one from uh, four years ago at Sodom and one from two years ago at Sodom when it was in Japan. Uh, the two years ago is still relevant, but this goes farther and examines what he didn't. Now, some of you are, there's probably a varying degree of familiarity with how a tile server run. this runs. Um, this is, it's a fairly complicated system with a good number of moving parts and um, they all need to work fairly quickly. One part is uh, OSM to PGSQL, which is the part that handles uh, getting the data into the database. It doesn't do any rendering itself. Now there is the style sheets, which is, there's been other talks on style sheets. I'm, I'm a tech guy, not a cartographer. I don't do pretty style sheets. And then where, where you really go for the optimization is a render, the rendering server part, which is what so creates the tiles and serves them up. Now, I'll, t I'll go over a few different the few different activities that get done which performance matters on. One is the initial import. This this takes about uh, 4 to 48 hours generally. It's loading for the entire planet 30 gigs of data into a database that ends up taking about 250 gigs. Um, it's, it's been it's improved. There's not really much you can speed up here. It's just there's a lot of data in the planet. Another activity that happens is uh, updates. This happens every day with uh, with OpenStreetMap. You can have your database kept up to date to within a minute. This this is there's not much load involved in with this. So there's not actually that many changes in comparison to an initial lo well, you know, load initially or the load from rendering. Then the, well, the first case that really matters for performance is uh, what happens when a user requests a tile. First of all, it might be in the browser cache, so it doesn't even reach the server. The second is it could hit Generally, you'll have a uh, content distribution network, edge caches, that kind of stuff. It could hit the, one of those and be cached. And for OpenStreetMap.org, it's about a 50% hit rate on those caches. The, um, about a 100 megabytes, 100 megabit traffic or so across that. And then, of course, it could not. It, those ta it could not be found in those caches, in which case it falls back to your rendering server where it hits Apache and it will go through a, uh, an Apache module called mod tile, which connect interfaces with render D or mod t or Tyrex, which are servers that handle daemons that handle the rendering. But first they'll go to what their ca tile cache, which is, in the case of OSM.org, about 90% of those requests will hit a cached tile. Of course, it may, the tile may not be cached, in which case render D embeds Mapnik, so it'll tell Mapnik render this style using this XML and it'll pull from your Postgres, Postgres database. This is the slow part. This takes about, you render, when you're rendering tiles, you render them in bunches of eight by eight, and it takes about one second to render a tile, a meta, what they're called meta tiles. So it takes about one second on a reasonably fast machine. 
So it renders them to the cache and then it serves them back up from the cache to the client. There, this approach is fair, really doesn't change with vector tiles either. You, you're not outputting an image, but the performance critical parts are basically the same. Most of your time is spent in Postgres and PostGIS, retrieving data from disk and uh, manip sorting, filtering, doing stuff to that data before it reaches Mapnik. So if you want to set up a tile server, the first thing you need to do is define your requirements. I've seen plenty of people go and get a t and rent a machine or buy a machine which does not suit what they need as a tile server. It's either vastly underpowered or overpowered. One of them means it won't work, the other means you've spent thousands of dollars, more than you needed to. So the first requirement is you have to figure out what you want to render. If you're rendering the planet, well, it's easy to figure out what you want then, but if you're, say, just concerned with a state or a country, you want to pick that area. Uh, so a smaller area is going to be quicker. The, it's one of the easiest ways to speed it up, particularly on a less powerful machine with less RAM. Uh, so the easiest way is Geofabric offers extracts and you can download the smallest extract that covers the area you need. It also, using their extracts also makes it a lot easier on you since you don't have to be slicing up the planet or providing your, your own diff, inf diff infrastructure to do the updates. The next th thing to figure out is how you want to do updates. It's possible, uh, the OpenStreetMap front page, that layer is updated every minute. So it average about 40 seconds between saving an edit to the database and it showing, and it being in the database and being able to be shown on the front page. Most people don't need that. Most, uh, if you can look at say, NavTech and TomTom, Tom, you'd be lucky to get a month update cycle. I've heard of people who get, who are happy when they can get an update each year out of them. Um, it's more efficient to update less often, uh, sub substantially so, and I'll get to that later, but those generally uh, every day, every hour, or every week is a reasonable time, unless you're doing a layer intended, intended for feedback for the editors, where you need it really quickly. A related question is, how old can you, the maps be that you're serving? If you're, if you're serving it as feedback for editors, you need really up-to-the-date data, but if you aren't, you can cache more aggressively, which means more stays in the browser cache, so less hits your servers, or more stay, and you get better hit rates on the edge caches, and it goes all the way back up the chain. The last parts are, re and the really difficult parts are load. Um, that's really a function of how many people are hitting your website and what they're doing. If you've got a little about page on your website, well, you probably won't be rendering your own tiles on demand, but if you had that, the average visitor would be fit viewing a lot fewer tiles than say Foursquare, which has a fairly large map, or OSM.org, where most users are there to view just the map and will zoom in, zoom out, pan around. There's, uh, I mean, you, you can look at the statistics for OSM.org, which are all online, to see its load, but really you'll have to figure this out for yourself, and it's probably going to be based on the number of website hits, which may itself be a guess. 
The other one is cash hit rates. I don't have a good way of predicting that. If, if all of your users view the exact same place, everything's going to be in cash. If users are, say, respond, are users like who would be doing a map roulette challenge, go to some random place in the middle of nowhere, they're not going to be getting stuff from the cache. Um, hardware, if you want more about the hardware, the second talk that I mentioned earlier, and I'll be putting up my slides so you can get the URL for it, has more info about hardware selection. It's less expensive than you might think, particularly if you don't need the full planet. Uh, you need, uh, but it's basically a database server that, you're purchase, that you need to rent or purchase. Uh, but you don't need redundancy, particularly, because if something fails, you can reload the data easily. You may need redundancy for uptime reasons, but not for data loss. I've rendered tiles on my home server easily enough, which is not particularly powerful, or a hosted one, which is even less powerful for High performance, though, I mean, standard SSD, lots of processor cores, lots of RAM. I mean, there's no magic there. Uh, OSM, tile at OSM.org, though, uses two servers to do all of its rendering. Uh, it could probably get away with one, but that w it would be pushing it. So it's... It takes less. Um, it takes less CP, uh, computing power than you might think for um, most web pages, and you're probably not. I mean, OSM.org has a lot of people who spend a lot of time on the map for obvious reasons. Your website's probably not going to have people spending that much time looking at the map. Now. So selecting your hardware is important, but you want to get the most out of it, so you need to optimize. And optimizing rendering is basically optimizing Postgres. Certainly, if you, there are optimizations you can do beyond the, this in MapNIC that speed it up, but you, you want to attack the Postgres side, first of all, because that's where the biggest performance gains are. And it's a, it's, this bottleneck is also common to vector tiles and image tiles. Something, one optimization is updates. So as I mentioned, the updates come minutely. You can get the updates minutely, hourly, or daily. Um, you group, when you download them, you group them up because you may be a few minutes behind and then apply them all to the database. But this grouping up, means that some things never have to make it to the database because if something is created and then deleted, the grouping will completely eliminate it. Uh, if you update less often, you spend less time. So if you, it's uh, how many hours per day is your machine spent updating? It may, I mean, it may be scattered in 10 second chunks of updating over every minute over the entire day, but the time adds up. Now, something else is if you're using an extract, you can still update with using daily files, and you don't really have any choice on how often to update. If you've got a really local load, so something that's got a strong peak usage, you could shift your updates to uh, off hours as well, which would allow you to get more peak load. So. If you cut down, if you change your batch to from one minute to say five or ten minutes, it cuts in about a third the amount of time that you uh, you have to spend. Your computer has to spend doing these updates, and five minutes is probably enough for most people. You get an hour is uh, got some got the advantage is another nice round number to use, but. Do you really need to, something else to think about? Is do you really need to update? Instead of updating, you can re-import the database and uh, 
drop the old database. If you've got small areas, I mean, it's very fast. The problem, I'm from British Columbia, and it takes about four or five minutes for me to import the entire province, which is pretty fast, and I don't bother doing updates, primarily because I had dropped the, I have to do some, uh, specialized stuff. Uh, and also, but one other thing is, an import is faster if you allow it to get rid of the data it needs to update. It can take, on a full planet, it can take more than an hour, maybe two hours less, if you allow it to do that drop. And it takes less disk space. There are also some other advantages for re-importing in terms of uh, table bloat and clustering, which I'll get to. So that's your updating. But updating is only really, on a, on a heavily used server, updating is only a small portion of the time it's been. It's particularly on a, I mean, when you've got a server with lots of cores, lots of RAM, and an SSD, it can consume a day's worth of updates in 30 minutes. That's not much percentage of its usage. So you've got to optimize what Mapnik is getting. And basically, this is what a Mapnik SQL query is going to look like. Instead of bbox, it's the area that, you're, that needs to render. Uh, it's, I mean, this is just a standard query. So what Postgres is going to do is it'll do an index scan, then filter out non-roads, and then sort the result by uh, Z order. So there's a few things here that can be sped up. The first is the index scan. It's got a scan for uh, ro roads in the bounding box. And you have an index to do this, obviously, or you'd have to scan the entire 20 gig, 200 millions of row table. Um, so you have an index, but this index covers every line, which is a linear feature, not just the roads. So what you want to do is make a partial index. So this would be, in this example, where highway is not null, an index that only contains highway. Now, partial indexes can be tricky. You have to match them to your queries. Uh, this would, if you had a query that it was, say, where highway is null or, sorry, where highway is not null or where railway is not null because you wanted to render the highways and railways out of the same data layer, this index would now be useless. But if you get them right, which isn't too hard, you just have to look at the conditions, you can get dramatic performance improvements. So one uh, common index is where building is null, which basically means that there's an index for the areas outside of France. Um, there are a lot. Of, uh, no, no. There are a lot of uh, queries that do not want buildings, such as land use, uh, admin boundaries, and you can add a building is null condition to them. So you make an index, and you get a total of about 20% performance increase out of this, which is huge. Uh, this is showing a couple of partial indexes. Another one is uh, one for water, um, for w when you're rendering the water, and that one similar. These are you get particularly good performance increases from the lower zooms where there is more data, because the. There are effects that I'll get to later on, but lower zooms t also tend to be slower anyways. High zooms are fast, but there's a lot of them. Another, the other part of the query is filtering. So you have to filter out your rows to get only, in this case, motorways and trunks. The partial indexes help a lot like the, a lot on this because 
you're, uh, if you're only getting where highway is not null, that means that you're not getting a lot of the stuff to, to filter out anyways. You can also do other indexes. I've tried B tree indexes like this like this one it, they're not they help but I've not seen a situation where they're better than partial indexes another uh, type of filtering is uh, rechecks of the geometry and this is this is fairly specific when scanning an index Postgres will build a location of on of what it needs to fetch from the disk. At low zooms, this list can be huge, uh, millions of rows that it needs to fetch. So it has to do a bitmap index in scan instead. And what that means is that it, it loses some data, basically. It, sim it simplifies it. So it, d it will fetch more rows than required, which means there are more rows to fetch, which is slower. There are more rows to filter. There are more rows to sort. So what you can do is give it more memory. And this is, the, this is a fairly standard adjustment to make to uh, a rendering server. You want to give it, it depends how much memory you've got and how many people are going to be hitting it, but 32 megs, 64 megs, something in that range, as opposed to the default, which I believe is one meg. The, the default Postgres settings are for a machine with very little memory. And most rendering th servers are going to have 16, 32, 64, lots of memory. And the last stage of this query was the sort. And again, work memory. It means that it can do a sort in memory instead of on disk. And work me the work memory adjustments, uh, 20 to 40 percent at, at some zooms, 50 percent or more. It's probably the biggest single change to increase performance is to adjust the work memory to larger. And if you adjust it too large, you will run out of memory when a lot of people hit your server, but you'll have to judge that on the basis of how many clients you let connect and how much memory you've got and all of that stuff. So another very standard performance optimization is clustering. What this means is that points or lines that are near each other geographically are also placed near each other on disk. Now, the standard way to do this is to cluster with that gist index. It's not the best way, though. There is another technique, clustering, making a geohash index, and this is SQL to do it, that clusters it much better. Uh, there's, Paul Ramsey did a good blog post on why. The takeaway, though, is it's 25% faster with the geohash clustering and 14% only with a gist way clustering. Now, I should mention that OSM to PGSQL does something which is basically clustering the tables, but the current released version does this wrong. It doesn't actually generate any improvement and in some scenarios can make it worse. We're working on that. We, we, we've got a fix for that. It, we're just, we just have to do some other stuff before we merge it. Now, if, you're impo if you were doing rendering, say, from NavTech or TomTom data, you don't have to worry about updates because they're so infrequent and you do them by reloading the database. With OpenStreetMap, you do do updates and you do them very frequently minutely even. So database maintenance matters. You can't just set it up and forget it. You need to, on a database like this, you need to, there are some changes you need to make. You have to increase the statistics so Postgres knows better what's in the table, which means it can plan the queries better, which means it makes smarter queries. Um, 
you have to worry about table bloat. Whenever a row in the table is deleted and a new one is inserted, it means that there's actually some empty space in that table. Auto vacuum will take care of this, but you probably have to make it more aggressive or you'll, the default settings are not great for huge tables and these are huge tables. Index bloat is distinct from table bloat because auto vacuum does not help index bloat. You have to re-index the table or completely rewrite the table. You can re-indexing re is fairly easy because you can do it con while you're still running the server. You don't have to stop anything. I mean, it slows stuff down because it's doing stuff, but it, it, you just you re-index concurrently and delete the old index. It's faster though if you can stop your rendering and rely on a different server and just re-index everything in parallel. It takes Doing it the least efficient way, everything in parallel sequentially takes about 80 minutes on the server I've been te testing on, which is fairly fast server. Uh, something to consider though is if you, that's, that's 80 minutes for just the rendering tables. There's both rendering tables and update tables. You have to consider which ones you need to re-index. You may not care about the fact that your updates are getting a bit slower because so little time spent on them, whereas you probably care about the rendering speed since you don't want to have to buy a more expensive server. Particularly since the update tables contain one index that can take hour, a couple of hours or longer to generate However, you can do, you can stop, I mean, it's a lot easier to stop, stop your updates than to stop your rendering. The last real maintenance is uh, cluster degradation. So you've, when you import it, you cluster it, everything is nicely arranged on disk so that everything geographically near is near on disk. But you start doing updates and that's no longer the case. So you have to make, you have to recluster, basically. Now, there is one way around that, and that's to re-import the database. And that, that is one advantage of not consuming updates, but just re-importing the database, is that you don't have to do any of this maintenance. It's because you just reload. On the other hand, you couldn't, say, update every hour by reloading, because the reload takes four to 48 hours. Now, po okay. Postgres provides some tools that will help you figure out when you need to do this stuff. There's the PG stat tuple extension. And one other way, which is a general tool for finding out how bloated your tables are, how much dead space there is in them. One other way specific to uh, rendering is you can look at the core at how disordered it is, and there's a correlation between that and your rendering speed. And this is some magic SQL that will be in the slides that I put up that will tell you how disordered it is. I'm not going to go over how that works. I don't. Unfortunately, I don't have. A math, I can't tell you that when it reaches this point, you need to cluster because it takes a long time to generate those numbers. Not the numbers for the, that you'd be looking at, but the numbers to tell you to tell you at what point you you need to and the relationship. Statistics needs large numbers, so. I've been doing this for a while and I'm still working on it, so there should be more upcoming results. Um, more better relationship between the slowdown and the disorder. Bulk rendering strategies, because I know some people render tiles in bulk instead of on demand, which has advantages and disadvantages. Um, I'm, something else is looking at HStore, which allows you to import all OSM tags, not just the ones that you consider of interest at the time of the import. This is useful if you've got the full planet and think you might want to add another tag later, which is the case of tile.osm.org. 
There's also some hopefully upcoming OSM to PGSQL features uh, included the, th the threading branch, which parts are threaded, but this makes more of it threaded, and it fixes clustering. Clustering is pretty important. Partitioning is also something that's probably on the table, and it will allow partition tables, which should drastically uh, speed up certain queries. Um, basically, building-related stuff is the obvious one. And I, int I intend to write some better tools to handle dumping the old data and reloading in new data, which is a fairly common scenario. I, so I, I'm not sure, do I have time to take questions? I do not have time to take questions, but I will be around today. I will also be around on the sprint on Monday, and I will probably be working on uh, tiles server rendering related documentation at the time.